Hello, my name is Katie and welcome to my video. Today uh, is Christmas, so if you celebrate, Merry Christmas. Otherwise, uh, I hope you're having a good day in general. Today I am going to film January new releases. Now if you watch December's new releases, you'll remember that there weren't that many books that I was interested in. Uh, January is not that way. <laughs> I'm actually a little bit afraid to film this. I was talking to my husband about it and I was like, I have a 19 page Google Doc of books for my new releases. And he was like, well yeah, but how many of those are you interested in? And I was like, uh, 19 pages worth? <laughs> and he was like, oh man, I better get my bank account ready. It won't be that bad because I won't buy them all. <laughs> I won't buy them all in one go, that's for sure. But these are just all the ones that I thought sounded interesting and wanted to share with you guys. As per usual, I'm going to go by genre and then by date within each genre and I will have each genre timestamped so that you can skip around and watch you know, what you're interested in so we're not here uh, all day. I'm going to start with YA, although the first book on the list is actually a middle grade novel. It's called Root Magic by Eden Royce. It comes out January 5th. From debut writer Eden Royce comes a wondrous historical ghost story set in South Carolina in the 1960s, an unforgettable tale of courage, friendship, and black girl magic. It's 1963 and things are changing for Jezebel Turner. Her beloved grandmother has just passed away. The local police deputy won't stop harassing her family. With school integration arriving in South Carolina, Jez and her twin brother, Jay, are be about to begin the school year with a bunch of new kids. But the biggest change comes when Jez and Jay turn 11 and their uncle Doc tells them he's going to, tells them he's going to train them in root work. Jez and Jay have always been fascinated by the African-American folk magic that has been the legacy of her family for generations, especially the curious potions and powders Doc and Gran would make for the people on their island. But Jez soon finds out that her family's true power goes far beyond small charms and elixirs, and not a moment too soon. Because when evil, both natural and supernatural, comes to show itself in town, it's going to take every bit of the magic she has inside her to see it through. God, that just sounds so magical. I don't read a ton of middle grade these days, but every once in a while, one comes along that really just grabs at my heart and makes me want to read it. And this is one of those. Coming on January 5th, we have The Awakening of Malcolm X by Ilyasa Shabazz. The Awakening of Malcolm X is a powerful narrative account of the activist's adolescent years in jail written by his daughter Ilyasa Shabazz along with the 2019 Coretta Scott King John Steptoe award-winning author Tiffany D. Jackson. No one can be at peace until he has his freedom. In Charleston prison, Malcolm Little struggles with the weight of his past. Plagued by nightmares, Malcolm drifts through days unsure of his future. Slowly, he befriends other prisoners and writes to his family. He reads all the books in the prison library, joins the debate team in the Nation of Islam. Malcolm grapples with race, politics, religion, and justice in the 1940s, and as his time in jail comes to an end, he begins to awaken, emerging from prison more than just Malcolm Little. Now, he is Malcolm X. Here is an intimate look at Malcolm X's young adult years. While this book chronologically follows X, a novel, it can be read as a standalone historical novel that invites larger discussions on black power, prison reform, and civil rights. I am interested in this book for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's really interesting that it's written by Malcolm X's daughter. I think that's going to add a lot to the story and add a lot of authenticity to it. The second reason is that I have a biography on Malcolm X that I got recently and I thought these would be good to pair together and read at the same time. So I, I, I probably will end up grabbing that one. I don't know how quickly because there's a lot on this list, but I, I think I will actually pick that one up. Also on January 5th, we have Lore by Alexandra Bracken. Now, I haven't read anything by Alexandra Bracken in a while. I think, oh my gosh, I can't even remember what that series is that she's famous for. The Darkest Minds, right? Somebody will know and somebody will let me know. <laughs> um, but this one actually sounds really good. Every seven years the Aegon begins, as punishment for a past rebellion, nine Greek gods are forced to walk the earth as mortals, hunted by the descendants of ancient bloodlines, all eager to kill a god and seize their divine power and immortality. 
Long ago, Laura Perseus fled that brutal world in the wake of her family's sadistic murder by a rival line, turning her back on the hunt's promises of eternal glory. For years, she's pushed away any thought of revenge against the man, now a god, responsible for their deaths. Yet, as the next hunt dawns over New York City, two participants seek out her help. Castor, a childhood friend of Laura believed long dead, and a gravely wounded Athena, among the last of the original gods. The goddess offers an alliance against their mutual enemy and, at last, a way for Lore to leave the egg on behind forever. But Lore's decision to bind her fate to Athena's and rejoin the hunt will come at a deadly cost, and still may not be enough to stop the rise of a new god with the power to bring humanity to its knees. Okay, uh, Greek mythology, fascinating. Athena is one of my favorite gods, well, goddesses, both, uh, both. Uh, <laughs> So there's just kind of like a lot there for me to love. Coming January 12th, we have Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas. If there's one thing 17-year-old Maverick Carter knows, it's that a real man takes care of his family. As the son of a former gang legend, Mav does that the only way he knows how, dealing for the King Lords. With this money, he can help his mom, who works two jobs while his dad's in prison. Life's not perfect, but with a fly girlfriend and a cousin who always has his back, Mav's got everything under control. Until, that is, Maverick finds out he's a father. Suddenly, he has a baby, seven, who depends on him for everything. But it's not so easy to sling dope, finish school, and raise a child. So when he's offered the chance to go straight, he takes it. In a world where he's expected to amount to nothing, maybe Mav can prove he's different. When King Lord blood runs through your veins, though, you can't just walk away. Loyalty, revenge, and responsibility threaten to tear Mav apart, especially after the brutal murder of a loved one. He'll have to figure out for himself what it really means to be a man. I really enjoyed The Hate You Give. I had been hesitant to read it because there was so much hype surrounding it. And I, I feel like a lot of people can relate to it. When there's a lot of hype around a book, your expectations tend to be really high and then you end up disappointed. So I put it off for a while and then when I read it, oh my god, it was so good. And Maverick Carter, who is our lead character in that book's father, was such an interesting figure to me that I'm so glad that Angie Thomas decided to write um, a prequel of sorts. The next book, I'm not sure if this is considered young adult or adult. I've seen it classified as different ways, but I'm putting it in the YA section. And that's Across the Green Grass Fields by Seanan McGuire. This is part of the Wayward Children series, which is a series of novellas about children who go to other worlds, like Narnia, Wonderland, etc., but then they come back to their world and just kind of struggle to fit in. Anyway, this is, uh, I think, the sixth book in the series? I'm not totally certain. Regan loves and is loved, through, though her school friend situation has become complicated of late. When she suddenly finds herself thrust through a doorway that asks her to be sure before swallowing her whole, Regan must learn to live in a world filled with centaurs, kelpies, and other magical equines, a world that expects its human visitors to step up and be heroes. But after embracing her time with the herd, Regan discovers that not all forms of heroism are equal and not all quests are as they seem. I will be getting that. I've been really enjoying the series. It's not like you know, a five-star across-the-board series for me. But I do find each book to be really enjoyable. And recently, with every release, I've been rereading the whole series from start to finish. Uh, just because they're very short and they're very good, and uh, I've just been enjoying them. Next in the YA category, we have Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. It comes out January 19th. 17-year-old Lily Hu can't remember exactly when the question took root, but the answer was in full bloom the moment she and Kathleen Miller walked under the flashing neon sign of a lesbian bar called the Telegraph Club. America in 1954 is not a safe place for two girls to fall in love, especially not in Chinatown. Red Scare paranoia threatens everyone, including Chinese Americans like Lily. With deportation looming over her father, despite his hard-won citizenship, Lily and Kath risk everything to let their love see the light of day. <sighs> that sounds amazing. As YA is not my typical genre that I enjoy reading, I was kind of surprised 
that I ended up with so many on this list, but this was one of the first ones I added. And not only does it sound just, just fantastic and unique, it's also blurred by Sarah Waters, who is quickly becoming one of my favorite authors of all time. The last book on this list is Wider Than the Sky by Catherine Field Rothschild. It comes out January 19th. 16-year-old Sabine Braxton doesn't have much in common with her identical twin Blythe. When their father dies from an unexpected illness, each copes with the loss in her own way. Sabine by poeting, an uncontrollable quirk of bursting into poetry at inappropriate moments, and Blythe by obsessing over getting into MIT, their father's alma mater. Neither can offer each other much support, at least not until their emotionally detached mother moves them into a ramshackle Bay Area mansion owned by a stranger named Charlie. Soon the sisters unite in a mission to figure out who Charlie is and why he seems to know everything about them. They quickly make a life-changing discovery. Their father died of an HIV-related infection, Charlie was his lover, and their mother knows the whole story. The revelation unravels Savine's world while practical Blythe seems to take everything in stride. Once again at odds with her sister, Sabine chooses to learn all she can about the father she never knew. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, she must decide if she can embrace his last wish for their family legacy, along with forgiveness. That's going to be heart-wrenching. Next, we have mystery thrillers. I think these are mostly just thrillers. I always say mystery thriller, and there never actually ends up being any mysteries on these lists. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, January 5th, The Wife Upstairs by Rachel Hawkins. Meet Jane. Newly arrived to Birmingham, Alabama, Jane is a broke dog walker in Thornfield Estates, a gated community full of McMansions, shiny SUVs, and bored housewives. The kind of place where no one will notice if Jane lifts the discarded tchotchkes and jewelry off the side tables of her well-heeled clients. Where no one will think to ask if Jane is her real name. But her luck changes when she meets Eddie Rochester. Recently widowed, Eddie is Thornfield Estate's most mysterious resident. His wife, B, drowned in a boating accident with her best friend, their bodies lost to the deep. Jane can't help but see an opportunity in Eddie. Not only is he rich, brooding, and handsome, he could also offer her the kind of protection she's always yearned for. Yet as Eddie and Jane fall for each other, Jane is increasingly haunted by the legend of B, an ambitious beauty with a rags-to-riches origin story who launched a wildly successful southern lifestyle brand. How can she, plain Jane, ever measure up? And can she win Eddie's heart before her past or his catches up to her? With delicious suspense, incisive wit, and a fresh feminist sensibility, the wife upstairs flips the script on a timeless tale of forbidden romance, ill-advised attraction, and a wife who just won't stay buried. In this vivid reimagining of one of literature's most twisted love triangles, which Mrs. Rochester will get her happy ending? Mm. Next, coming on January 5th, we have The Push by Ashley Audrain. Blythe Connor is determined that she will be the warm, comforting mother to her new baby Violet that she never had. But in the thick of motherhood's exhausting early days, Blythe becomes convinced that something is wrong with her daughter. She doesn't behave like most children do. Or is it all in Blythe's head? Her husband, Fox, says she's imagining things. The more Fox dismisses her fears, the more Blythe begins to question her own sanity, and the more we begin to question what Blythe is telling us about her life as well. Then their son Sam is born, and with him, Blythe has the blissful connection she'd always imagined with her child. Even Violet seems to love her little brother. But when life as they know it is changed in an instant, the devastating fallout forces Blythe to face the truth. The Push is a tour de force you will read in a sitting, an utterly immersive novel that will challenge everything you think you know about motherhood, about what we owe our children, and what it feels like when women are not believed. Next, coming on January 12th, we have The Perfect Guests by Emma Roos. 1988. Beth Soames is a 14-year-old when her aunt takes her to stay at Raven Hall, a rambling manor in the isolated East Anglian Fens. The Avrils, the family who live there, are warm and welcoming, and Beth becomes fast friends with their daughter, Nina. At times, Beth even feels like she's truly part of the family, until they ask her to help them with a harmless game, and nothing is ever the same. 2019. Sadie Langton is an actress struggling to make ends meet when she lands a well-paying gig to pretend to be a guest at a weekend party. She has sent a suitcase of clothing, a dossier outlining the role she is to play, and instructions. It's strange, but she needs the money, and when she sees the stunning manner she'll be staying at, she figures she's got nothing to lose. In person, Raven Hall is even grander than she'd imagined, even with damage from a fire decades before. But the walls seem to have eyes. 
As day turns to night, Sadie starts to feel that there's something off about the glamorous guests who arrive, and as the party begins, it becomes chillingly apparent their unseen host is playing games with everyone, including her. First off, Emma Roos wrote The Au Pair, which I read over the summer and absolutely adored, so that alone would probably be enough to get me to read it. However, the overall premise sounds fascinating, and it's one of those gothic style stories that I just love so much. Next in thrillers is Girl A by Abigail Dean. It comes out January 21st. Lex Gracie doesn't want to think about her family. She doesn't want to think about growing up in her parents' house of horrors, and she doesn't want to think about her identity as Girl A, the girl who escaped. When her mother dies in prison and leaves Lex and her siblings the family home, she can't run from her past any longer. Together with her sister Evie, Lex intends to turn the House of Horrors into a force for good, but first she must come to terms with her six siblings and with the childhood they shared. I think that's kind of a really good synopsis for a thriller, because it gives you like the basics about what the book is about, but there's so much there that it doesn't tell you that I need to know now. <laughs> Okay, so for science fiction and fantasy, I actually think, yeah, there's only one, and it's a sci-fi. Uh, Persephone Station by Stina Light? I don't know. It comes out on January 5th. Persephone Station, a seemingly backwater planet that has largely been ignored by the United Republic of Worlds, becomes the focus for the Sarao Sur Sur Orlov Corporation, as the planet has a few secrets the corporation tenaciously wants to exploit. Rosie, the owner of Monk's Bar in the corporate town of West Brenner, caters to wannabe criminals and rich earther tourists of the sort at the front bar. However, exactly two types of people drank at Monk's back bar, members of a rather exclusive criminal class and those who sought to employ them. Angel, ex-marine and head of a semi-organized band of beneficent, <laughs> beneficent criminals, wayward assassins, and washed up mercenaries with a penchant for doing the honorable thing, is asked to perform a job for Rosie. What this job reveals will affect Persephone and put Angel and her squad up against an army. Despite the odds, they are rearing for a fight with the Surreo Orlov Corporation. For Angel, she knows that once honor is lost, there is no regaining it. That doesn't mean she can't damned well try. It's been a while, I think, since I've read a science fiction that I just really, really loved. Other than the Expanse series. I think that's it. Okay, historical fiction. This is the longest section. I really tried to narrow it down. I did, but there were so many and they all sounded so good. First, coming on January 1st, is A Splendid Ruin by Megan Chance. A spellbinding novel of dark family secrets and a young woman's rise and revenge set against the backdrop of the devastating 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The Eo Destruction. After her mother's death, penniless May Kimball lives a lonely life until an aunt she didn't know existed summons her to San Francisco. There she's welcomed into the wealthy Sullivan family and their social circle. Initially overwhelmed by the opulence of her new life, May soon senses that dark mysteries lurk in the shadows of the Sullivan mansion. Her glamorous cousin often disappears into the night. Her aunt wanders about in a laudanum fog, and a maid keeps hinting that May is in danger. Trapped by betrayal, madness, and murder, May stands to lose everything, including her freedom, at the hands of those she trusts most. Then, on an early April morning, San Francisco comes tumbling down. Out of the smoldering ruins, May embarks on a harrowing road to reclaim what is hers. This tragic twist of fate, along with the help of an intrepid and charismatic journalist, puts vengeance within May's reach. But will she take it? This one, I don't read much set in the early 1900s and I don't know that I've ever read anything surrounding the San Francisco earthquake so for that reason I am curious about it but I also I don't know I feel like the synopsis isn't really giving me that much to go on especially because it goes into like this could be her chance to escape or whatever but like I never really understood that she was trapped? I don't know. I'm assuming the book will actually go into it more, so so we'll see. I think I want to see some reviews on that first. Next, coming on January 5th, The Seagate by Jane Johnson. After Rebecca's mother dies, she must sort through her empty flat and comes to terms with her loss. 
As she goes through her mother's mail, she finds a handwritten envelope. In it is a letter that will change her life forever. Olivia, her mother's elderly cousin, needs help to save her beloved home. Rebecca immediately goes to visit Olivia in Cornwall, only to find a house full of secrets, treasures in the attic, and a mysterious tunnel leading from the cellar to the sea, and Olivia nowhere to be found. As it turns out, the old woman is stuck in hospital, with no hopes of being discharged until her house is made habitable again. Rebecca sets to work restoring the home to its former glory, but as she peels back the layers of paint and grime, she uncovers even more buried secrets. Secrets from a time when the Second World War was raging, when Olivia was a young woman, and when both romance and danger lurk around every corner. <sighs> I love, like, m stories that are kind of multi-generational. And I also love stories where somebody is learning about somebody else's story. So I think this is going to be really good. Oh, this one sounds phenomenal. Coming January 5th, Outlawed by Anna North. The day of her wedding, 17-year-old Ada's life looks good. She loves her husband, and she loves working as an apprentice to her mother, a respected midwife. But after a year of marriage and no pregnancy, in a town where barren women are routinely hanged as witches, her survival depends on leaving behind everything she knows. She joins up with the notorious Hole in the Wall Gang, a band of outlaws led by a preacher-turned-robber known to all as The Kid. Charismatic, grandiose, and mercurial, the kid is determined to create a safe haven for outcast women. But to make this dream a reality, the gang hatches a treacherous plan that may get them all killed, and Ada must decide whether she's willing to risk her life for the possibility of a new kind of future for them all. I'm so interested in that. At first, because when I first saw it, like looking at the cover and stuff, it very much reminded me of just like a western, and western is not my genre. But this seems like something new, and I am intrigued. Next we have The House on Vesper Sands by Parak O'Donnell. It comes out January 12th. London, 1893. High up in a house on a dark, snowy night, a lone seamstress stands by a window. So begins the swirling, serpentine world of Parak O'Donnell's Victorian-inspired mystery, the story of a city cloaked in shadow but burning with questions. Why does the seamstress jump from the window? Why is a cryptic message stitched into her skin? And how is she connected to a rash of missing girls, all of whom seem to have disappeared under similar circumstances? On the case is Inspector Cutter, a detective as sharp and committed to his work as he is wryly hilarious. Gideon Bliss, a Cambridge dropout in love with one of the missing girls, stumbles into a role as Cutter's sidekick. And clever young journalist Octavia Hillingdon sees the case as a chance to tell a story that matters despite her employer's preference that she stick to a woman's society column. As Inspector Cutter peels back the mystery layer by layer, he leads them all at last to the secrets that lie hidden at the house on Vesper Sands. <sighs> I cannot remember the last time I read um, like a Victorian mystery, and that one sounds fantastic. Next, on January 12th, we have Find Me in Havana by Serena Burdick. Cuba, 1936. When Estelita Rodriguez sings in a hazy Havana nightclub for the very first time, she is nine years old. From then on, that spotlight of abjuration, from Havana to New York's Copacabana and then Hollywood, becomes the one true accomplishment no one can take from her. Not the 1933 Cuban Revolution that drove her family to poverty. Not the revolving door of husbands and the fickle world of film. Not even the tragic devastation of Castro's revolution that rained down on her loved ones. Thirty years later, her young adult daughter, Nina Rodriguez, is blindsided by her mother's mysterious, untimely death. Seeking answers no one else wants to hear, the grieving Nina navigates the troubling, opulent memories of their life together and discovers how much Estelita sacrificed to live the American dream on her own terms. Based on true events and exclusive interviews with the real Nina Rodriguez, Find Me in Havana weaves two unforgettable voices into one extraordinary journey that explores the unbreakable bond between mother and child and the ever-changing landscape of self-discovery. I don't understand how you could read that synopsis and not think that sounds amazing. I, I don't, I don't get it. Oh, this is another one that I want desperately. The Last Garden in England by Julia Kelly. It comes out January 12th. I feel like... I'm afraid I've been saying July in some of these cases instead of January, and I sincerely hope that's not the case. 
Present day, Emma Lovett, who has dedicated her career to breathing new life into long-neglected gardens, has just been given the opportunity of a lifetime to restore the gardens of the famed Highbury House estate designed in 1907 by her hero, Venetia Smith. But as Emma dives deeper into the garden's past, she begins to uncover secrets that have long lain hidden. 1907. A talented artist with a growing reputation for her ambitious work, Venetia Smith has carved out a niche for herself as a garden designer to industrialists, solicitors, and bankers looking to show off their wealth with sumptuous country houses. When she is hired to design the gardens of Highbury House, she is determined to make them a triumph, but the gardens and the people she meets promise to change her life forever. 1944. When land girl Beth Pedley arrives at a farm on the outskirts of the village of Highbury, all she wants is to find a place she can call home. Cook Stella Adderton, on the other hand, is desperate to leave Highbury House to pursue her own dreams. And widow Diana Simmons, the mistress of the Grand House, is anxiously trying to cling to her pre-war life now that her home has been requisitioned and transformed into a convalescent hospital for wounded soldiers. But when war threatens Highbury House's treasured gardens, these three very different women are drawn together by a secret that will last for decades. <sighs> we have the multi-generational thing. And what's cool to me, because of my love for books that focus on houses, estates, whatever, that element is here as well. Although in this case it seems more like a garden, which is another thing I really enjoy reading about. Okay, next we have some nonfiction. First, coming on January 5th, is The Eagles of Heart Mountain, a true story of football, incarceration, and resistance in World War II America by Bradford Pearson. The impeccably researched, deeply moving, never-before-told tale about a World War II internment camp in Wyoming and its extraordinary high school football team. For fans of The Boys in the Boat and The Storm on Our Shores, neither of which I have read or heard of. In the summer of 1942, the United States government forced 120,000 Japanese Americans from their homes in California, Oregon, Washington, and Arizona and sent them to internment camps across the West. Nearly 14,000 of them landed on the outskirts of Cody, Wyoming, at the base of Heart Mountain. Behind barbed wire fences, they faced racism, cruelty, and frozen winters. Trying to recreate comforts from home, they built Buddhist temples and sumo wrestling pits. They grew Chinese cabbage and daikon radishes, yet there was little hope. That is, until the fall of 1943, when the camp's high school football team, the Eagles, started its first season and finished it undefeated, crushing the competition from nearby predominantly white high schools. Amid all this excitement, American politics continued to disrupt their lives as the federal government drafted men from the camps for the front lines, including some of the Eagles. The young man faced a choice to either join the army or resist the draft. Teammates were divided, and some were jailed for their decisions. Set during a complex political and cultural moment in America, the Eagles of Heart Mountain honors the resilience of unlikely heroes and the power of sports in a sweeping and inspirational portrait of one of the darkest moments in American history. I have so many thoughts about this book already, and I haven't even read it. So I'm just, I'm not gonna sit here and spew them all out right now because I'm gonna actually go through and read it first. The only thing I'm gonna say is can you imagine being forced from your home, locked up in a camp, and then drafted to go to war? What kind of crap is that? Next, we have a, well, there's actually a couple of like science-y nonfiction on this list and I am excited. When Brains Dream, Exploring the Science and Mystery of Sleep by Antonio Zadra comes out January 12th. Questions on the origins and meaning of dreams are as old as humankind and as confounding and exciting today as when 19th century scientists first attempted to unravel them. Why do we dream? Do dreams hold psychological meaning, or are they merely the reflection of random brain activity? What purpose do dreams serve? When Brains Dreams addresses these core questions about dreams while illuminating the most up-to-date science in the field. Written by two world-renowned sleep and dream researchers, it debunks common myths that we only dream in REM sleep, for example, while acknowledging the mysteries that persist around both the science and experience of dreaming. That sounds so good. <laughs> okay, this one, so, it, I don't know if I've made this clear, 
But I am not a super big fan of memoir, me memoir type uh, nonfiction. But this one has me intrigued. The Secret Life of Dorothy Soames by Justine Cowan. It comes out January 12th. Justine had always been told that her mother came from royal blood. The proof could be found in her mother's elegance, her upper crust London accent, and in a cryptic letter hinting at her claim to a country estate. But beneath the polished veneer lay a fearsome, unpredictable temper that drove Justine from home the moment she was old enough to escape. Years later, when her mother sent her an envelope filled with secrets from the past, Justine buried it in the back of an old filing cabinet. Overcome with grief after her mother's death, Justine found herself drawn back to that envelope. Its contents revealed a mystery that stretched back to the early years of World War II and beyond, into the dark corridors of the Hospital for the Maintenance and Education of Exposed and Deserted Young Children. Established in the 18th century to raise bastard children to clean chamber pots for England's ruling class, the institution was tied to some of history's most influential figures and events. From its role in the development of solitary confinement and human medical experimentation, to the creation of the British Museum and the Royal Academy of Arts, its impact on Western culture continues to reverberate. It was also the environment that shaped a young girl known as Dorothy Soames, who bravely withstood years of physical and emotional abuse at the hands of a sadistic headmistress, a resilient child who dreamed of escape as German bombers rained death from the skies. Heartbreaking, surprising, and unforgettable, The Secret Life of Dorothy Soames is the true story of one woman's quest to understand the secrets that had poisoned her mother's mind and her startling discovery that her family's fate had been sealed centuries before. Doesn't that sound good? To me, that sounds good. Next, we have The Doctor's Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine, coming on January 19th. Elizabeth Blackwell believed from an early age that she was destined for a mission beyond the scope of ordinary womanhood. Though the world at first recoiled at the notion of a woman studying medicine, her intelligence and intensity ultimately won her the acceptance of the male medical establishment. In 1849, she became the first woman in America to receive an MD. She was soon joined in her iconic achievement by her younger sister, Emily, who was actually the more brilliant physician. Exploring the sisters' allies, enemies, and enduring partnership, Janice P. Nomura presents a story of trial and triumph. Together, the Blackwells founded the New York Infirmary for Indigenous Women and Children, the first hospital staffed entirely by women. Both sisters were tenacious and visionary, but their convictions did not always align with the emergence of women's rights, or with each other. From Bristol, Paris, and Edinburgh to the rising cities of antebellum America, this richly researched new biography celebrates two complicated pioneers who exploded the limits of possibility for women in medicine. As Elizabeth herself predicted, a hundred years hence, women will not be what they are now. It's just so full of female power. There are a lot more nonfiction releases on here than I, than I thought there were. Um, next is The Mission, a true story by David W. Brown. It comes out January 26th. A masterful genre-defying narrative of the most ambitious science project ever conceived, NASA's deep space mission to Europa, the Jovian moon, where might swim the first known alien life in our solar system, powered by a motley team of obsessives and eccentrics. When scientists discovered the first ocean beyond Earth, they had two big questions. Is it habitable, and how do we get there? To answer the first, they had to answer the second. And so began a vivacious team's 20-year odyssey to mount a mission to Europa, the ocean moon of Jupiter. Standing in their way, NASA, fanatically consumed with landing robots on Mars, the White House, which never saw a science budget it couldn't cut, Congress, fixated on going to the moon or Mars, anywhere really, to give astronauts something to do, rivals in academia, who wanted instead to go to Saturn, and even Jupiter itself, which guards Europa in a pulsing, rippling radiation belt, a halo of death whose conditions are like those that follow a detonated thermonuclear bomb. The mission, or how a disciple of Carl Sagan, an ex-motocross racer, a Texas Tea Party congressman, the world's worst typewriter saleswoman, California mountain people, and an anonymous NASA functionary went to war with Mars, survived an insurgency at Saturn, traded blows with Washington, and stole a ride on an Alabama moon rocket to send a space robot to Jupiter in search of the second Garden of Eden at the bottom of an alien ocean inside of an ice world called Europa is the Homeric never-before-told story of modern space exploration and a magnificent portrait of the inner lives of scientists who studied the planet's solar system with... <sighs> who studied the solar system's mysterious outer planets. 
David W. Brown chronicles the remarkable saga of how Europa was won and what it takes to get things done down here and up there. I want that book. That sounds like such a Katie book. Okay, I think, I think we're almost done with nonfiction. Uh, uh, uh. Ida B. the Queen, The Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells by Michelle Duster. It comes out January 26th. Called a dangerous Negro agitator by the FBI and a brave woman, a brave woman by Frederick Douglass, an inspiring biography of the American pioneer by Ida B. Wells' great-granddaughter Michelle Duster. Winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize Special Citation, Ida B. Wells was born enslaved in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862. In this inspiring and accessible biography, Duster tells the incredible story of Wells' life, including stories from her childhood in Mississippi, her famous refusal to give up her seat on a ladies train car in Memphis, and her later work as a pioneering journalist and anti-lynching crusader. Overlooked and underestimated, Wells would single-handedly change the course of American history and come to inspire millions. I to be the queen shines a bright light on one of the most extraordinary women in history. Okay, final section, and thank God because I have a headache. This is like a miscellaneous assortment of things. I guess most of these would be considered like literary fiction, but I kind of hate the term literary fiction because it seems to me like it's a little inaccessible. I don't, I don't know, so I'm putting it as miscellaneous. First is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. It comes out January 12th. Reese almost had it all, a loving relationship with Amy, an apartment in New York City, a job she didn't hate. She had scraped together what previous generations of trans women could only dream of, a life of mundane bourgeois comforts. The only thing missing was a child. But then her girlfriend, Amy, detransitioned and became Ames, and everything fell apart. Now Reese is caught in a self-destructive pattern, avoiding her loneliness by sleeping with married men. Ames isn't happy either. He thought detransitioning to live as a man would make life easier, but that decision cost him his relationship with Reese, and losing her meant losing his only family. Even though their romance is over, he longs to find a way back to her. When Ames's boss and lover, Katrina, reveals that she's pregnant with his baby and that she's not sure whether she wants to keep it, Ames wonders if this is the chance he's been waiting for. Could the three of them form some kind of unconventional family and raise the baby together? This provocative debut is about what happens at the emotional, messy, vulnerable corners of womanhood that platitudes and good intentions can't reach. Tori Peters brilliantly and fearlessly navigates the most dangerous taboos around gender, sex, and relationships, gifting us a thrillingly original, witty, and deeply moving novel. So I did look up Tori Peters, and this does seem to be um, an own voices story, because I, a lot of the time when you get a story and you're, you're reading it and you realize that it's about a group that's like marginalized, I guess would be the word there, I get kind of concerned at who was writing it and whether whether the intent is to make money by trying to reach uh, like untapped market or whether it is an author who genuinely just wants to reach people who have lived the same experiences. And this does seem to be a case of the latter, which is, which is really good. And I am actually really curious to read it myself and then see um, what other people have to say about it. Next we have At the Edge of the Hate by Catherine Seligman. It comes out January 19th. Maddie DiNaldo, homeless at 20, has made a family of sorts in the dangerous spaces of San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. She knows whom to trust, where to eat, when to move locations, and how to take care of her dog. It's the only home she has. When she unwittingly witnesses the murder of a young homeless boy and is seen by the perpetrator, her relatively stable life is upended. Suddenly, everyone from the police to the dead boy's parents want to talk to Maddie about what she saw. As adults pressure her to give up her secrets and reunite with her own family before she meets a similar fate, Maddie must decide whether she wants to stay lost or be found. Against the backdrop of a radically changing San Francisco, a city which embraces a booming tech economy while struggling to maintain its culture of tolerance, at the edge of the hate follows the lives of those who depend on makeshift homes and communities. I don't know that I've ever seen a book that discusses homelessness like this before especially not in like a fictional format, 
That and the fact that it's set in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park, which is a place I've been to several times, uh, really, really makes this an interesting one for me. This next one, I'm not... I've seen it several times and in several places categorized as YA, but I don't know that it really feels YA to me, so I just put it here in the miscellaneous section, and I guess each of you can decide for yourself what you think. Um, if I Tell You the Truth by Jasmine Carr it comes out January 19th. Told in prose, poetry, and illustration, this heartrending story weaves Kieran and Sahara's timelines together, showing a teenage Kieran and later her high school age daughter Sahara. Kieran is a young Punjabi Sikh woman who becomes pregnant after being sexually assaulted by her fiance's brother. When her fiance and family don't believe her, she flees home. T she flees her home in India to Canada where she plans to raise the child as a single mother. For Kieran, living undocumented means constant anxiety over finances, work, safety, and whether she'll be deported back to the dangers that await her in Punjab. Eighteen years later, Kieran's daughter Sahara is desperate to help her mother, who has been arrested and is facing deportation. In the aftermath, Kieran reveals the truth about Sahara's conception. Horrified, Sahara encourages Kieran to speak out against the man who raped her, who is now a popular political figure in Punjab. Sahara must find the best way to support her mother while also dealing with the revelation about her parents. Like, I get that it seems t that it seems to mostly follow teenagers as far as Kieran being quite young when she had Sahara and Sahara now being a teenager, but I, I don't know. It feels... I guess it'll really just depend on how it's written. Next, we have Burnt Sugar by Avni Dashi. It comes out uh, January 26. I would be lying if I say my mother's misery has never given me pleasure, says Antara, Tara's now adult daughter. In her youth, Tara was wild. She abandoned her marriage to join an ashram, and while Tara is busy as a partner to the ashram spiritual leader Baba, little Antara is cared for by an older devotee, Kali Mata, an American who came to the ashram after a devastating loss. Tara also embarks on a stint as a beggar, mostly despite her affluent parents, and spends years chasing a disheveled homeless artist, all with young Antara in tow. But now Tara is forgetting things, and Antara is an adult, an artist, and married, and must search for a way to make peace with a past that haunts her as she confronts her the task of caring for a woman who never cared for her. Sharp as a blade laced with caustic wit, burnt sugar unpicks the slippery, choking cord of memory and myth that binds mother and daughter. Is Tara's memory loss real? Are Antara's memories fair? In vivid and visceral prose, Tibor Jones' South Asia Prize-winning writer Avni Doshi tells a story at once shocking and empathetic about love and betrayal between a mother and a daughter. A journey into shifting memories, altering identities, and the subjective nature of truth, Burnt Sugar is a stunning and unforgettable debut. That's the type of book that I think would be great for like a book club or a buddy read because there's so much to unpack there. And I mean, I guess it would depend on whether or not the author crafts the story in a way that, you know, there is a lot, but just based on the synopsis, it sounds like it's going to be very complex and complicated emotional story that really deals with right and wrong. And I, I don't know, that just, that just that, that's the type of thing I like to read. The last book on the list is Bride of the Sea by Iman Kota. Uh, it comes out January 26. During a snowy Cleveland February, newlywed university students Munir and Sita are expecting their first child, and he is harboring a secret. The word divorce is whispering in his ear. Soon their marriage will end and Munir will return to Saudi Arabia, while Sita remains in Cleveland with their daughter Hanaji. Consumed by a growing fear of losing her daughter, Sita disappears with the little girl, leaving Munir to desperately search for his daughter for years. The repercussions of the abduction ripple outward, not only changing the lives of Hanadi and her parents, but also their interwoven family and friends, those who must choose sides and hide their own deeply guarded secrets. And when Hanadi comes of age, she finds herself at the center of this conflict, torn between the world she grew up in and a family across the ocean. How can she exist between parents, between countries? Iman Kota's Bride of the Sea is a spellbinding debut of colliding cultures, immigration, religion, and family, an intimate portrait of loss and healing, and ultimately, a testament to the ways we find ourselves inside love, distance, and heartbreak. 
That one's going to be emotional, too. I feel like so many of these books are just emotional journeys. So those are the books that are on my list for January 2021. No, I will not be buying all of them. But those are the ones I'm interested in right now and thought maybe we could chat about in the comments. Uh, so let me know if any of those interest you. If you're new here and you like my content, uh, subscribe. Stick around. I'd love to see you in my comments. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you soon. Bye.